Hi, everyone. This is Jason Bierko of Wall Street for Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a returning guest. He entered Wall Street in the mid-1980s with neither formal education nor training and within three years was appointed head of investment strategy for a leading New York Stock Exchange member firm. He would go on to hold positions as chief market strategist, portfolio manager for four hedge funds and a mutual fund that bore his name. His autobiography, Confessions of a Wall Street Whiz Kid, was first published in 2011 and there's multiple versions. Peter Grant, Thank you for joining me again. Thank you for having me back, Jason. So, Peter, we just had another Fed rate hike. It was 25 basis points instead of what some of the Fed members wanted, a more aggressive 50 basis point rate hike. Do you think we're getting pretty close to the end of the Fed raising interest rates? I don't think we're quite there yet. I think that once the inflation genie is out of the bottle, very hard to put it back in. We're even now seeing some of the Fed governors pushing back to 2025 before they see it their magical 2% rate. I don't think we're going to see 2% rate for several years. I, it's too many things that uh, uh, that the inflation has already kicked in to, to bring it down to that level again. Uh, I think we would need to have almost a, a very deep recession, if not something close to the depression. But uh, nevertheless, I, I think if you think about where we were a year ago, what I've coined the don't worry, hap- be happy crowd on Wall Street was already talking about by the spring of this year, a pivot. Well, that pivot isn't coming anytime soon. The numbers keep coming out that just aren't going to justify them to not only pivot, but even stop halt, uh, raising rates. I think they're going to continue. I, they, they're not going to be as aggressive as they first started, but there's no reason yet to think that they're going to stop. Yeah, I agree. I don't see any hints of them dra- dramatically lowering interest rates. So they may slow the pace of the rate hikes, but I don't see them dramatically cutting rates like a lot of the stock market bulls have been betting on. Well, th- you can toss a lot of those people off the top of a building, Jason, and all the way down, they'll all say, hey, so far, so good. I mean, <laughs> th- as as much as there's and always a doom and gloom crowd. There's a much bigger, it's always a great time to invest crowd. And they're throughout the financial service industry. And we've seen a lot of younger people become financial advisors. The experience now, uh, they've not even had to deal with a market that goes down and stays down. So of course, this year, their motto is, it always comes back to their clients. And if it doesn't come back this year, and clients have two straight years of no gains, it causes a lot of problems for their financial plans because they're all heavily invested based on the stock market and for retirees to pull out money and then the stock market goes up and makes up for that. That isn't happening. And I don't know if that group can stand another year of no gains. And we're recording this interview on Friday, February 24th, 2023. The dollar index is back above 105 at 105.22. Do you think that a lot of these interest rates increases and the Fed has done one of the fastest rate hike, the pace of the rate increases is one of the fastest in Fed history. Do you think that these interest rate increases are priced into asset markets and the real economy yet? No. Uh, and, and that's why, as you said, as we speak, we've had some pretty harsh days, uh, most recently to the downside. And uh, that group that I always like to call the don't be happy crowd would like to believe it's baked in. but You'll know it's baked in when you have news like we had and the market doesn't go down. But right now, the market is still reacting to anything that suggests that the Fed will keep raising rates, the market turns down. And until we don't see that anymore, the, the, you got to expect that trend is going to continue. Yeah, I don't think we've seen a real estate bust. Um, you're around New York City. I mean, there's just all these headlines of commercial real estate vacancies and problems with the landlords. I just got a headline, uh, an article from Seeking Alpha saying these real estate investment trusts, which hold enormous amounts of commercial real estate, they're cutting their dividends, they're cutting their yield. So these are all red flags with these higher interest rates. We haven't seen bankruptcies yet, but there's a lot of warning signals coming. So a year ago, I did an interview and it was kind of covered a lot. And I said, real estate prices are going to fall 20 to 40%. And the most flack I got was from people involved in commercial real estate or and or the people who invested in the real estate investment trusts for the dividends. And I said, listen, those dividends aren't secure. You have to understand if things slow down a lot, they can't keep paying those dividends. And 
a lot of investors, particularly seniors, over the last couple of years before the market turned down, went heavily into dividend paying stocks because they couldn't find income to live off of in the fixed income market. The Fed destroyed the fixed income market as we knew it when they drove interest rates down to zero. So it's twofold of real estate turning down. Yes, it impacts all the commercial players and all, but it's also going to impact a lot of people that bought them for the dividends when they start cutting them. And the other one with higher interest rates are the debt for these large corporations. So junk bonds, the stuff that's really interest rate sensitive. So these leveraged balance sheets, because for almost 15 years, Peter, the Fed was doing zero interest rate policy. So a lot of these large publicly traded companies, they just kept loading their balance sheet with debt and doing share buybacks. Well, now interest rates are a lot higher and their balance sheet is loaded with high interest rate debt. Yeah, and it was kind of crazy a few days ago, just the junk bond yield was only a, per a percent and a quarter higher than really good grade bonds. And there's still a lot of damage that could be done there. And let's not forget when the pandemic hit and the Fed literally refloated some zombie companies, those companies haven't really done well in the recovery. So they're going to be the first ones that we're going to hear about that are having substantial problems. And it's getting very tough to borrow money unless you're you know, a double or triple A type company. Do you think ultimately after the Fed creates this bust with a lot of bankruptcies, the Fed's going to have to end up buying back this junk bond debt, collateralized loan obligations, which are even worse uh, they have even worse collateral than junk bonds, these securitized derivatives. Uh, is that what's going to happen after the bust with these uh, interest rate increases? We have a tremendous debt crisis. We have, I've been talking a lot about it, people starting to recognize that we have a retirement crisis. But the crisis that really no one but the most dire forecast people speak about, but it's still out there, and that's the, the, the potential derivative uh, crisis. And we don't know to the extent of how much is out there, but it's kind of like dominoes when you watch that TV program and they knock that first domino and 3,000 fall. If ever it gets to the derivative market, then unfortunately the Armageddon type forecast, which I'm not in that camp, uh, takes hold. Well, normally they just paper things over since 2008, right? So every time there's potentially a catastrophe with the doomsday crisis, the Fed just comes into the rescue and they print trillions of dollars. We don't get the real number, but we find out a couple of years later that there was a bank that failed or a couple European banks that failed and there was going to be all these derivatives dominoes, like you said. So do you think then the banks just are going to keep getting away with more and more shenanigans? I don't think they have the same capabilities to do, as you just said, as they did in previous years. One of the issues that the Fed is going to be running into soon is the CBO said that with all this talk of having to readjust entitlements and, you know, that's about 70 trillion of what people are expecting in Social Security, Medicare and Medicaid to the 30 something trillion we already have in hard debt. But one of the issues that that is coming up now and people realizing it, the CBO saying as much as 19 trillion more dollars will be added on in the next 10 years. How do we start servicing the interest payments when they're close to two trillion dollars? When we only have a GDP that's maybe twice or a little bit more bigger than that. I mean, it's it, it really is a, a, a really scary scenario, Jason. I have stated I'm going to be in this going into my 40th year, and I don't ever remember having these many bearish fundamentals and this dire of an outlook that actually has led to part of my depression, because I, I, I see how it is not being even considered within the general financial service industry. They're still, you know, happy-go-lucky. It always comes back. Don't worry. And there's no caution uh, in a lot of people. And th th a lot of people overextended. Listen, Jason, 75% of Americans are working paycheck to paycheck. I mean, there's no room for them in any of this stuff, let alone two years of 10% plus inflation. What has that done to them? It made them use credit cards to pay for normal stuff they would pay cash with. So we can go on and on. But again, uh, the, the Federal Reserve, is really caught in a bind because if they raise for too long and too high, they actually accelerate some of these difficulties I just spoke to you about. So 
they kind of are already painted in the corner, even though it doesn't look that way. But I think right now they feel that inflation is the most important thing they have to deal with. And remember, they blew it on the upside. This is a group that didn't say we were going to have what we ended up having. So I don't know how you have a lot of confidence in somebody that was wrong before on something. You can't just assume they're going to get it right this time. Well, the Fed doesn't have a track record over the for many decades of creating a soft landing. And I'm from the Austrian School of Economics. I mean, central banks like the Federal Reserve Bank, they create artificial boom and bust cycles because they kept interest rates artificially low and capital was cheap. So created all these asset bubbles and a and a culture of speculation on Wall Street and made easy sales. Very similar what to the junk bond sales in the 80s. I mean, there's just countless, the tech bubble, all the the housing bubble, there's all these different bubbles that have happened, Peter, over the course of your career. You know, I, I'm still in a planning group and it's a planning group that focuses on cash flow, not chasing net worth, which almost all financial plans. And if they just would read the disclaimer to people, they can see how much of a chance it really has happening because Basically, the disclaimer says, we don't think it's going to happen, so we want to cover ourselves. But nevertheless, people's lifestyles, Jason, are living far more on the means than our parents and grandparents did. And I always use this group, and they didn't do anything wrong, but they're the symbol for what I just said, and that's public storage. You cannot drive on any many road, on any main road in in the United States and not come across a public storage facility. And this is a lot of people keeping stuff that can't fit it into their four or 5,000 square foot home, which our parents and grandparents never had. So the other issue is, and it's very hard for Americans to accept this, when I tell them, listen, you gotta live a less is more life because we're a consumer driven economy. 70% of the GDP is driven by consumer spending. And I just don't see how Any of these Wall Street economists can talk about such growth anytime soon when all the things are stacked against the average consumer right now. Also, it seems, Peter, and we've seen a lot of this with the commitment of traders lately, and it's been delayed the data. The banks just get away. Banks in these large hedge funds like Citadel get away with so much shenanigans, basically financial crimes, accounting fraud, felonies. You wrote your book, Confessions of a Wall Street Whiz Kid. Were there a lot of examples of bankers and hedge funds getting away with accounting fraud and financial crimes while you were working on Wall Street back in the 1980s, similar to like the movies, Wolf of Wall Street, uh, the book, Liar's Poker? Was that the culture? It was always the culture, but I think the unfortunateness is I don't think people realize how badly some people have lost in the last 12 to 24 months. And I'm I'm going to go to an, an, an area which steal people because they hated me because I never spoke about it. But near the top, I said, don't own any of it. And that's cryptocurrencies. And I don't think people have yet grasped how much was lost, completely lost. I mean, years ago, you talk about 30 years ago, they went crazy when a penny stock house, you know, sold some penny stocks like the Wolf of Wall Street and all. That is minute compared to what was hyped about cryptocurrencies and so many coins that this is and we don't know yet if we've hit the bottom of that criminality or poor judgment because we don't know the extent of this ftx i mean I, i make a joke and i say this guy that ran ftx when you tell him what do you think of bernie madoff he has one answer amateur because this was i think will go down as the biggest scam related to investing in, in the history, and it and it, will, it hopefully uh, most of it will come out that there isn't a guilty plea and everything's washed, and he tries to save himself. So we get to see a lot of this stuff. So I, 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 I there's always been wherever then there's money, there's criminality, but uh, the amount of uh, losses that people took uh, in the cryptocurrencies and many completely wiped out. You know, it's not like it went down 20, 30 percent. I mean, gone. It's gone. There's no chance of it coming back. And yet there's a guy that's been touting Bitcoin that just every day says it's going to a million, it's going to a million. And there will be survivors of that industry, just like there were survivors of when the Internet bubble broke. But to talk and and and, and just carelessly throw out numbers that were being thrown out every day and on a certain financial network, they had experts on there that were. 21 and 22 years old, and they were, we were told they were multimillionaires by these coins, when the only really mathematical 
thing they've ever faced before that was an algebra class just a few years ago in high school. And yet they were out giving advice and people three times their age were following it. And uh, that money's gone, Jason. And, and it's not really spoken about of how much was actually lost. And a lot of them were gambling on their phones. And I was seeing screenshots. People were sending me this bragging that they were trading for an hour or two a day, just looking at a couple charts. And they were making 200 to $800 per day, day trading, just doing that. That's how easy the money was for profits for a lot of these cryptocurrency trading. But of course, a lot of those people didn't keep cash. They didn't diversify. They didn't pull profits out. So when they did have profits and they were just too greedy because they thought that the prices of these cryptocurrencies would keep going up and up. And then when they started going down just a little bit, there was a lot of dip buying and then people ran out of cash. And then you had the FTX scandal and a lot of people had cash there in the in their accounts at FTX and also crypto and it's gone. And one of the things that's going to happen now is because the government is always late to the party in terms of regulating. But now there's no chance that they're going to be light on the cryptocurrency industry, no matter at the time people thought there was a lot of money being thrown by the cryptocurrencies, the politicians that they could swing something. But now it's just there's just too many wide losses in this story of FTX. They have to come down hard on it. And it's just going to make that industry that much tougher for the survivors to prosper again. But some will, but it's still not worth in my book to be looked at. What also pisses me off the most, Peter, is that a lot of these senior banking banking executives, so you have all these banks that manipulated LIBOR, they, they manipulated foreign currency exchange rates, they were manipulating the precious metal market or other commodities market. I mean, there's there's cases, I think one of the largest commodities trading firms just said that they paid for all this nickel, over $500 million worth of nickel at the London Metals Exchange, and there's no nickel in the warehouse. And how many bankers, how many of these senior bankers are going to go to prison? Well, that's been the problem, you know. When you look back at the 2008 mortgage fiasco, a few lower management people got sentenced or what have you, but no one really paid that big price. And unfortunately, you can go back hundreds of years, there's just certain people who have power and connections uh, escape this. And, and markets are more easier to manipulate now because things happen so fast and you can it, before you blink an eye something could be moved in a, in, in, in a certain direction and I would just caution people I'm approaching 40 years and I've known a few a few people in this business and all these people that come out with these get rich quick trading systems uh, they've come and gone and they've made more money selling the system than actually implementing the system and so I would just, as I always do caution everybody, for most people, trading is not a good thing. It's okay if you want to play around a little, you're retired and through dollars, but to think you can make a living in it, you're going in with a BB gun and you're playing against people that got tanks. And uh, it's just, it, most retail people end up losing. Yeah, I think high frequency, to add to your points there, I think high frequency trading is just a more advanced form of new technology, billions of dollars invested in these um, nanosecond trading systems and all the high frequency cables of front running what what a lot of these Wall Street brokerages used to do in the 80s. So I would say that um, the financial crimes and accounting fraud and the tricks that these large banks and hedge funds play are more expensive and more sophisticated than in the past. Absolutely. I agree with you. But do, do you think that the accounting fraud and the financial crimes and the market manipulations, is it worse than when you were in uh, working at banks and hedge funds in the 1980s? I think it impacts more now because more people, whether they know it or not, are invested because the 401ks kind of took the place of pension plans. And most even small people incomes have get a chance at a 401k and what little they have is in there. Uh, you know, an interesting thing, Jason, that came out, Fidelity came out the other day, and they said the average retirement fund last year alone lost 24%. Uh, you know, if, if that doesn't come back, you have a problem there because retirement plans are almost always have some sort of the 4% rule. That's the standard uh, paper cutting financial planning that most firms do. I mean, they add bells and whistles and have beautiful commercials, but at the end of the day, they're chasing that work. They, they're taking products that performed a certain way in the past 
parachuting it out and saying, hey, if it does it again, you reach everything that you need. The problem is when you have down years, even if it doesn't go down further, but if it doesn't go back up, these people have to draw more principal out and it's not being replenished with gains. You can get away with that one year telling people, hey, don't worry, it comes back, it comes back. But if it doesn't come back this year, a lot of those people are going to say, I can't risk loss more principal. And that's where the people that are in the crash mode or 50% down, which I'm not, that's where I believe their opportunity can come if that transpires. If this market keeps going down or, or even just stays negative, by the end of the year, we could see a lot of liquidation. And one other thing, Jason, people don't talk about either. Over half the money that's in stocks is in passive investments. It's not being actively management. It's either in an index or an ETF, and they're trying to track something. So the manager or managers is not concerned about buying this stock, selling this based on losing all. It, it, it manages it based on inflows and outflows. So when the market was going up, they were self-fulfilling prophecies, but they can also be that to the downside. And if these passive funds start to see a lot of liquidations from these people that we spoke about, it feeds on itself. That's where the that's where the real risk is uh, for the stock market to go a lot lower this year. It's not so much whether the Fed keeps raising rates. It's not that that's baked in, but it's not something that's just universally just a shocker and everybody reacts negatively. But suddenly net liquidations of passive funds could cause the avalanche that some people think is still coming. Those indexes are also market cap weighted. So when more uh, savings comes in or someone wants to put more money into their retirement account from a paycheck, it goes into shares of Amazon, Apple. So the meme stocks, Netflix, Google, Tesla Motors, it, the same stocks get more capital allocated to it. So this is not like you said, this is not a money manager like Peter Lynch or yourself going in and doing extra work, looking for undervalued stocks, going in and trying to buy natural gas companies when the natural gas price crashed, what, 60, 70%. They're not going in and looking for the low cost natural gas producer that hedged at a higher price or has listed on their balance sheet. They're not doing any of that. When I entered the business, Jason, 90% of the trading was from individuals. And individuals were buying and selling stocks just like they would buy or sell businesses to be part owners. That is maybe 10th on the list. Up near the top is casino-like gambling, where it's computer-driven. People are using computer programs where they don't even know the name of the company or the name of the CEO, but it's part of a of a system where, as you said earlier, where they can trade very quickly and hedge this way or that way. The stock market, what I knew when I started, and now when you see it on that network in the background, that might as well be a museum because most of the trading isn't even happening there. It's happening in uh, computers uh, away from New York City. And uh, like I said, uh, the general public is just not being told because the typical financial advisor doesn't know or doesn't want to know. And even if they did, their firm doesn't want them sharing that type of stuff of the dangers that are out there now. And they don't have protection or a plan B. They only have a plan A. And most of those financial advisors are really just salespeople. So they may have a chartered financial analyst designation or a couple other designations, but they're really just salespeople collecting assets under management and trying to get fees and commissions. And they believe in this modern portfolio theory, which is basically for uh, it's the same type of uh, chunk investments for people of different ages that you have 60% stocks and 40% bonds, and it doesn't really adjust that much. Well, you're right about the asset gathering. It, years ago, we did our own stuff. In other words, if you dealt with somebody, whatever the ABC, I won't name anyone, but call them ABC. That person basically helped you make the decisions or made the decisions. Now, most of those people just gather the money and turn it over to a, a management group that the brokerage firm is involved with, and they share in the fee. And what's bad about that is once they've done that with you, you think they're still sitting there each day over, overthinking your portfolio and you know if something happens and all. No, you're done. They're, they're looking for the next person that they can gather assets from. So, and that's the other thing that I don't like happen. I think this uh, hands off and turning it all over to uh, bigger firms, I think the individual suffers from that. They don't get the same care that I thought 
that 20 or 30 years ago that I, I think the average person gave them. Yeah, when my parents, uh, they had a lot of money at one of those ABC places in 2008, 2009. And the person, their investment advisor, which was really a salesperson, wouldn't even pick up the phone for them. So there was a bunch of phone calls and emails during the 2008 crash, and they wouldn't even get an email or phone call back. Well, th that is always uh, a bad thing in extremes. People now also uh, are quicker because they can trade through discount, which costs next to nothing. So long-term investing is one year or less now. When I started, if you picked up a research report, it had a three to five year outlook. You talk to somebody about a multi-year uh, plan of holding something and all until at least last year, and that might've changed. People looked at you and go, I'm not gonna wait that long. And investing takes a lot longer uh, than you realize. And in the difficulty now for public companies, there's been no really good fiscal policy out of Washington for small to mid-sized businesses for 20 years, let alone what the pandemic did to terribly to small businesses, shut many of them down. You talk to anybody that's in any type of small business for more than 20 years, and they'll tell you it's 10 times more difficult to run their business from regulation to cost, et cetera. And now you have going to have the most dysfunctional Congress, because not only do the two parties want absolutely nothing to do with each other, but even within those individual parties, there's a fraction that kind of disagrees with the, the majority and all. So uh, I, I just don't see how uh, it, it's going to be finger pointing and investigations and before you know it, because Congress runs every two years, they're running again. So uh, there's just a whole mess out there socially, politically, and economically and uh, I, I just don't see how it can all come together and have substantial rises in the stock market. I just don't think that's possible. Yeah, and I think gold's going to be a good bankruptcy hedge going forward. I don't know what's going to happen to gold prices in the short term over the next two, three, four, six months. But over the next two or three years, I think gold's going to be a very good bankruptcy hedge and inflation hedge because I, I just don't trust either political party in D.C. to do the right thing. Both political parties are actually still talking about increasing spending. Well, they only have two choices, Jason, cut spending, which they're not good at, at all, or raise spending through revenue. And uh, the, 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 the amount of taxes that's going to be put on people that will be working five or 10 years from now, compared to what they make versus 10 or 20 years ago, is going to be dramatic. And it's going to get to a point, and people don't want to hear this part, but we're going to get to the point where there's going to be a battle of the ages, Jason. Some 30 or 40 year old man or woman who's being taxed to death is going to say, wait, you're raising my Medicare and Social Security takeout again for some 85 year old person so they can get a new lung or this. Let them die. I mean, it's a terrible thing, but it's already happened in Canada. Canada has brought in law and is engaging its medical profession. To basically suggest to very old people, you, you know, you, you might want to consider just dying versus going through all of this and all. Well, and that's I the problem with socialized medicine. That's rationing, right? So, Yeah, and I just see that there's going to be a battle. And each person has the right to say something. The person being taxed and the person that was old who paid out, took out so much of their money, finally they wanted this to happen when it came. And so there'll be a battle of the classes. And there'll also be a battle of the ages at a time when, listen, this is a company that lives on, you know, fake money. I mean, it's just uh, when you start talking about a hundred trillion dollars of debts, hard and entitlements, I mean, I just it, it, it's unfathomable to me that we ever got to the T's, let alone a hundred or, you know, trillion. It's just I don't even think people realize what a hundred trillion actually is. And uh, that's where we're at. And uh, they're going to get to the point where paying the interest is going to be a challenge. And uh, we're not we're not loved or liked uh, like we were as a country 20 or 30 years ago at a time. And I think this is important, Jason, where it clearly appears, because that's why I think central banks have been such big buyers of gold, that there's a movement away from the dollar. And also a likelihood of an alternative currency or at least groups 
trading without using the dollar. And that in itself uh, is going to be a major negative impact to the United States. And it's coming. That that That's, if I had to risk my life on anything, it's, it, it may be months away or a few years away at most, but it is coming. We've already seen a handful of it happening, but I think it's going to come away in life in certain countries and certain areas of the world. Those other countries are also fed up with the size and magnitude of the bailouts because since 2008 and 2009, the order, the bailouts have gotten orders of magnitude larger each crisis. Well, the thing that they also trouble about, and again, financial advisors don't know this and don't talk about it, is by increasing the strength of the dollar, it, it hurts the emerging market, those type of companies, that they get very hurt by a, a, a radical dollar. But look at a com- country like Japan. They say by 2040, they're only going to have one person working for everybody retired. And they've been basically buying their own bonds. The the central bank there has really been the only buyer of the bonds. So it's paper on paper. There are so many things in the Western civilization that can go wrong. uh, And most people are just not prepared for it. And, And Jason, this is what they say to me. Pete, I know you're right, but I'm praying you're wrong. (laughs) <laughs> hope is not a very good investment strategy. No, it's a wonderful it. spiritual strategy, but it's the worst investment strategy. So I want to transition now to gold and silver companies because I know you used to cover them for a very long time in your newsletter. I also do a lot of interviews about them over the years. Do you think that these higher interest rates, are they going to force a lot of these gold and silver miners and the royalty companies to do mergers and acquisitions that maybe a couple of years ago they wouldn't have had to do? But now they're going to say, I can't get the capital. I can't raise the funds. I can't build a mine. The capital is not available. So we're just going to do mergers and acquisitions and wait this out. Well, I think there's going to be an, a, a dramatic increase in mergers and acquisitions out of necessity. In other words, a lot of the smaller com- – It's very. I just did a video today literally – to explain to people how much more difficult the junior resource market is now than it was 10, 20, or 30 years ago. And the actions, again, and you know, we had a disaster of a, of a junior market last year, which I unfortunately participated in, but there's going to be first out of necessity. The only good news in that is the majors, and I mean the top tier companies, they're in much better financial shape than they've been in years. Usually by this time, they're indebted. Uh, they have negative cash flow. A lot of them have good free cash flow. And I think they're just sitting, licking their chops, waiting to pick off these things that are going to happen. But there is a bigger story. If you're going to believe in this electrification, which it looks like the Western world is completely committed to, the governments here, are all the cars are coming electrical, all the trucks, everything. But if you're going to buy that story, there's two issues that you've got to get over. One, the minerals needed for this are in short supply. It's been a lot of underinvestment, not just in oil, but in mining over the last 10 or 15 years. So there's not a lot of ready cobalt and copper and all these other things that are going to be needed for the electrification. There's not a lot out there. And there's a lot less countries where it's safe to operate. We're seeing all sorts of issues now in countries from social, political, and economical to mining companies. And so they have to shrink where they're going to look at. But the other one that's even more concerning is a lot of these technology things have these metals that I can't even pronounce their names, but they're called rare minerals. Well, the rare mineral market is basically controlled by China. We don't have any real substantial supply of our own. And we're moving more and more as an adversary with China than we are trying to be closer with them. So if you're going to believe this electrification, you then have to ask yourself, even if you get the minerals, we have a grid system in the United States that I like to joke, I think Thomas Edison installed some of it. And there is a lot of money that's going to be need to go in to make available all this electricity because right now we have these blackouts and brownouts just from current demand, yet the amount of demand that they expect to be increased by this electrification, how does the current system provide that? There's not a lot of money being thrown into new electrical grid systems at the moment. So there's a lot of lot of issues 
to, if you believe in electrification, and one of them is going to be a mineral. So companies that have worthy projects, not in bad places, are going to sell for a premium while others are going to struggle. But that whole industry struggles because it's much more difficult now for a junior resource company to not only raise capital, but find worthy investors. They've been shut out in the U in, in the United States. It's almost impossible for a financial advisor to solicit or unsolicited order of a junior resource stock anywhere in the U.S. The amount of brokers that used to exist that built a book of business, where if you got that broker interested, you got his or hers 200, 300, 400 clients, that's gone. So it's very hard for these juniors to get to the end user. And then there's hardly that many funds that buy them. There's not a lot of mutual funds or institutional people that buy that lower tier. So they have a big challenge. And they are many times the people that go and find these initial deposits and then the majors take over. So the mining industry has some serious challenges ahead of it, irregardless of what the metal prices may or may not do. That's your point, sir. I think also the Canadian investment banks and the U.S. investment banks, a lot of them either don't want to fund a lot of these projects for mines, and they definitely do not want to do capital raises for a lot of these juniors. I mean, there used to be a lot of these when uh, ten when I started in 2007, 8, 9, there was a lot of merchant investment banks in Canada, which were mid-level sized banks, and they used to be able to fund juniors. A lot of those have gone the wayside. They were pretty much gone by 2015 or 2016 to help juniors raise capital. Yeah, and they also went into other areas. They were a lot of those people went into the cannabis, and then they went into the cryptocurrencies. And uh, so it, it is a, it is a big challenge. Uh, I, I brought that out in a video that I made today. But if you're going to believe in this electrification and all, please start to explain to me how we get all this extra copper, cobalt, lithium, and other metals. Uh, because even if we threw a lot of money at it today. It doesn't come out of the ground tomorrow. It takes a very long time from start to, to find, develop, and get a mine up and running. So uh, I think there'll be in a year or two a little bit of a hiccup in electrification when people start to realize, man, we need a lot more metals that's out there. We're already seeing people like Tesla and all trying to buy companies up that have the supplies that they need because they recognize that there is an ample supply. And some of the areas in the world some people just don't want to go into anymore. Well, did you see that the Chinese government, their state-run mining companies are making big investments into Bolivia for lithium mines? Well, they've been not only there, but in a lot of other places. And, uh, you know, I I kind of half laughed and then I kind of got half sad because I said to me, we have Chinese companies buying farmland here. They're not buying the farmland so they can sell those tomatoes and everything to us. And the farmland is right next to a military place. I mean, it's just, I, I don't know, you know, it's just, it's, if you, if, if you sit and look at all the things that are troublesome, it's hard to get up. I mean, it really is. I've not seen this much concern in so many things. You know, there always was a doom and gloom crowd. There was always that crowd. They existed. They used to be called the hard asset crowd. And they would have two or three or maybe four topics that they could talk about to get people interested in whatever it might have been, dry food, ammo, cabins in the woods. Now they have like 20, 30 things they can point to people. And uh, it, it's it, Jason, I, I have to tell you, there's a fear in me of, of a bed. And I'm, and I'm hoping that my faith can overcome the fear. And uh, and it's and it is a challenge. But if you watch Bubble Vision what on CNBC, they're talking about how the bear market in stocks is over. The Fed's going to stop rate hikes soon and the asset prices are going to soar back and there's not a recession. So they're just spinning it. So there's not a recession. Yeah, the inflation's a little higher than people thought, but there's not a recession yet, even though what tens of thousands of people are losing their high paying six figure jobs at these big tech companies and S&P 500 companies. And they're desperately looking for lower paying jobs. I mean, in in the past, that would be textbook recession, but it's all being spun that it's not a recession and that the higher inflation is not that big a deal because asset prices are going up again. Well, I don't watch that financial network. I don't even watch Fox Business anymore. The only network that I'll turn on 
and I'll only turn it on in the morning because they have a wonderful uh, reporter, Lisa Abramowitz, who really is one of the few clear-headed, sees things as they are, financial journalists. The other network that you spoke about is is just a it's just a it's a it's a station for the don't worry, be happy crowd. And they were so big in allowing all sorts of people on with cryptocurrencies. And then they just washed their hands like they had no responsibility for it and all. And of course, they have someone that goes on there that rings bells and does all the stuff. And that person's performance is so bad that there's literally an investment opportunity to invest opposite of what he is saying. That's how poor certain people think that person is in terms of giving advice. So I've never, uh, I've turned off financial networks. And quite frankly, uh, there are better people individually on the net right now than anything you can get from those financial networks. At least more honest compared to the spin. I mean, they were, they pump whatever's going up, they just pump more. That's kind of the general rule really since 2008, 2009. Anything that's going up, they just pump it even more to try to push the trend even higher. Yeah. Uh, and, and also, because the people that advertise on their station where they get their revenues are the same people that are pushing that stuff. Well, Peter, I really enjoyed our discussion today. Is there anything you're actually optimistic about, though? I am optimistic that there will be certain commodities because electrification is going full force. Governments are committed to that. There may be a hiccup and be take slower than they thought it could be. But there's such a shortage of certain metals. So I, I try to focus there. I think in everything, adversity creates opportunity. But I think the slogan, and again, most people don't want to hear this, Jason, but less is more. I think if we look back at our parents and grandparents, they had a lot less things. But every medical study says we're more of a mess now than our parents or grandparents were. So getting away from too much stuff is is I think is a good thing. But again, it's not a popular thing in a in a consumer driven economy. I don't think we're going to turn on networks, financial networks, and have people such as myself speaking like that. And if you did, you're not coming back. Yeah. I mean anyone who talked about gold price manipulation or fraud with the bankers or uh, criticize the Federal Reserve Bank too harshly, you're not invited back on CNBC. Look at Peter Schiff and Michael Pento and those guys. Yeah, well, that was always I was I was called the tinfoil hat until they caught all the guys that were manipulating the gold, charged and found guilty. Now, of course, we're not called tinfoil hat guys anymore. Well, during the investigation, they only threw a couple low level traders under the bus, right? The mid level managers, the guys making the real profits, the bank. I mean, the bank paid a fine and they threw a couple low level guys under the bus. They're going to do some prison time, but that's about it. Well, that's how it usually is. The only good news, let's end on this, is that for gold trading now, the paper market is moving more to the Far East. It's no longer just London and the Crimex, Comex, I call it the Crimex. And there, there's not as much of the manipulation. So hopefully uh, it's less, it's never going to go away. And the financial community in the United States will always view gold as kryptonite. They're never going to get behind it. Because to support it and tell people to own it goes against the principle of their financial assets that they make their living selling offer. So don't look for a U.S. financial service firms to suddenly like gold at any time until it's if it ever goes backwards, just flying crazy and they have to cover it. But they're never going to stick their neck out and talk about it. Oh, yeah, I totally agree. I mean, what's being promoted is stocks, bonds, real estate, uh, these real estate investment trusts. But we're starting to see the dividend cuts now because of these higher interest rates and the vacancies from a recession or depression. A lot of these tech firms and other companies are cutting back on commercial office space. But a lot of people were sold these real estate investment trusts. And now the dividend cuts are coming. They're going to be bag holders. Yeah, I told you that. That's unfortunately where a lot of seniors placed in order. You know, when the Fed destroyed the fixed income market and Ginny Mays and things used to be seven, eight, nine percent, and you can live off fixed income. They chased everybody into principal risk lost investments. And now it's coming home to roost. And not only just in real estate, but other companies uh, are going to cut back the dividends. I, I've had seniors, and let me finish with this, Jason. I live in a senior community. I've had seniors tell me, I don't care if the stock goes down 20 percent, just don't cut the dividend. And I mean, now, unfortunately, they're going to face dividend cuts. 
Yeah, because the business has to survive. I mean, it depends on the balance sheet and the cash flow and the profit margins and stuff like that. But these businesses are dealing with higher, some of them higher labor costs, a lot higher input costs from inflation, their interest payments on the debt are rapidly rising. So th these are not uh, things that normally mean that the dividend is going to stay intact. Absolutely. Okay, well, I really enjoyed our discussion today, Peter. Hopefully we'll have you back on again soon. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Jason. God bless.